But life espionage is always rough. You're dealing with other people trying to backstab you, steal your intel, and make off with the goods. You think you've got what it takes to be the ace of spies? Let's find out. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Tox from CritsHappen.com. Thanks for watching and welcome back. Today we've got a critical review of another Albino Dragon game called The Ace of Spies. This is part of another Kickstarter program that they have going on right now called the White Rabbit Playing Cards. If you have a chance, you can check that out by clicking here. It'll take you to the project and you'll see that some of the pledge levels will include getting a copy of Ace of Spies. This was successfully funded on Kickstarter last year. It's a two to five player game for ages 13 and up and plays in about 30 to 45 minutes. When you first pick up the game, it may take a little longer just to get used to the mechanics, but once you've got it down, 30 to 45 minutes is about right as advertised. But what is the game all about? Well, as you can tell from our opening, it's all about cloak and dagger and espionage. It's ducking and dodging and diving to avoid your opponents coming after you. You and your rivals are going to be professional spies. Your job is very simple, complete missions. You do that by going to different cities between Berlin, London, and Paris, where you will collect things like intelligence, spy gear, locations, and other agents to complete these missions. You'll get mission points, and at the end of the game, the person with the most mission points will be the ace of spies. But of course, as it usually is in the world of espionage, Nothing is as simple as it appears on the surface. Come with me, get on your darkest glasses, your biggest trench coats, and let's see what it takes to become the Ace of Spies. So here we see the starting setup for Ace of Spies. There is a small score track that counts up to 25, and then tokens for 25 and 50 as you cross over those thresholds. You have five different meeples to keep track of your score as you go along. There is a mission deck, and then there is three different colored city decks. And each city going from left to right is going to be Berlin, which is red, London, which is yellow, and Paris, which is orange. Now at the beginning of the game, everybody gets two cards from each deck. So I'll take two and represent the player of us. We'll take a look at them and we'll see different things. For instance, we'll see the snitch. The snitch is an interrupt card, and this can be played at any time. It can be played on my turn or on my opponent's turn, and it'll give negative two points to their missions, because if you read, it says, I get to replace an agent on an opponent's completed mission with this card. The agent goes to your hand, and that mission is now worth negative two points. So you can see already, there's a good amount of theme in this game from Espionage and Cloak and Dagger. There are agents, which will provide points for completed missions, and the agents have two different abilities. At the top, you have an ability that you will uh, gain an advantage of when you play it as part of a completed mission. On the bottom, in this box with the little spy icon, is an ability that you could gain if you choose to play it from your hand. We'll get into that more in a second. But just know that agents give you two different options. There are also spy gear, which is going to be the spy glass, which are also worth points, but just have flavor text. There are intelligence pieces, which are briefcases, which also give you points and don't really have anything other than flavor text on them. There are locations as well, which will be represented by the building, which again will give you points towards completing your missions. So let's take a look at these missions. To begin the game, after everyone gets their cards, everybody gets dealt three mission cards. Very similar to kind of like taking your uh, route cards in Ticket to Ride. Now you'll notice on these missions that there are different points and that there are different icons. And this is what you will need to collect to complete those missions. So for example, one with the knight will give me six points if I can complete it using an orange agent, an orange intelligence, and an orange location. And yes, when you get playing this game, 
Agent Orange comes into play a lot with jokes. <laughs> uh, Ein Berliner Bit is actually a four points, and it's a little bit less. Although you need the same things, an agent, an intelligence, and a location, you need a red location, but your intelligence and your agent could be of any color from any city. So it's a little easier to complete. And then in the middle here, you've got something that's kind of uh, a little hard and a little difficult, but a little easy because you can have any agent you want, but you need to have a yellow intelligence and a yellow location. Now, as I get these three cards, I can choose to keep one, two, or all three to begin the game. Now, the problem with taking all three of these is I need a color from each city. So you'd want to compare what's in your hand to start out with. And if you have a lot of these location cards, maybe from each of the decks, it's a good idea to start off with multiple different uh, missions to complete. But let's say I just said, you know what? I just want to keep the uh, archives and Ein Berliner bit, and I'll keep those in my hand. These can either be placed down in front of you or into your hand, but they do not count against your hand limit of 10 cards. Only the Ace of Spies cards count against your limit of 10 cards. Now you'll notice I put that into a discard pile. Any uh, missions that you choose not to accept go into a discard pile. The game can end when any one of these four decks runs out of cards. So if people start completing missions really quickly, that deck can run out really quick in a four and five player game. Now you'll notice also that the decks are different heights. So the red deck is the most common, that's Berlin. And then there's London and there's Paris, and those cards are gonna have a little bit less. So they're a little harder to complete those missions and usually will be worth more points. Now we'll also show you there are some missions that are very challenging, like this one that requires two orange intelligence, one orange agent, one orange location, and one orange spy gear. So you need to really get digging in the orange deck to get that stuff out. And because there's a little fewer amount of cards in the orange deck, when you're playing in a four or five player game, those missions can be really, really valuable. Now the final thing you do to set up the game is you flip two cards from each deck face up. Now why do you do this? Well, when it's your turn to go, you have a couple of different options that you can choose from. The first thing is you can take two cards from the center city decks. And what I mean by that is you have the option of taking any face up card and if you do, let's say for instance, I wanted to take the troop locations which is a orange intelligence piece and it gives me two points towards my completed missions. Let's say I take that card and then the next one flips up. If I know I needed to get an orange agent, I didn't keep that mission, but if I know I needed to get an orange agent, I now know that that card is face up. But if I decided, you know what, I don't want any of those cards that are face up, I can go ahead and take a card that's face down. And you'll notice that I could take it from a different city. You're allowed to jump from city to city. It's not like you have any traveling or any time in between or anything like that. The rules though state that if you take a card, you must take two, no more, no less. So you can't choose to just take one, hit your max hand limit of 10 and not have to worry about discarding. If you have nine cards in your hand, you're gonna to have to take two cards, either any combination of two face up, two face down, or one face up and one face down. And at the end of your turn, if you can't complete missions, you're going to have to discard down to 10 cards. So after you've taken and drawn your cards, that is the end of your turn and it would move on to the next person. So after you've taken and drawn your two cards, you then have the option of completing missions. To complete a mission, all you have to do is declare that you have all the pieces, flip over the card, and then add your pieces to it. So let us say, for example, that I had the ability to complete this mission. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and take some of the cards in here to show you how we would do this. So let me flip through here, we'll get a couple of the cards out and we'll show you what they are. Here we go. Let, well, actually, let me go ahead and take one of these. So let us say that we had these three cards and this mission. We have the archives, which is a yellow intelligence, a yellow location, and any color agent. So in this case, I would have a yellow location, I would have a yellow intelligence, and I would have an orange agent. 
The first thing I would do is I would add up all of these points. So I have 11 points total and I would move my meeple 11 points on the scoring track. Then I would look at my agent and see what my bonus is. And this one says, take any agent from an opponent's completed mission, add it to your hand. This is where the dirty tricks and the underhandedness come in for Ace of Spies. Let us assume that our opponent had a similar type mission. And all of the agents in the game are worth two points, but their abilities range very greatly. If I played this as my completed mission, I would then do whatever the agent says to do on the top, which says to take an agent from their uh, opponent's mission. So let's say I just scored that and I made 11 points. Well, let's say my opponent had 14 points from a mission that they had completed. I would then take an agent from his mission. He would lose the two points and go back, and I would gain that agent to play in a later mission or play at a later time very, very big amount of swings in points. And it can happen really quickly, really fast. Because as you can imagine, all of the agents are going to try to undermine all of the other agents. There are things that will completely make you discard a completed mission. And some missions can be upwards of 14, 15, 20 points, depending on what cards you put together to make up the completed mission. There are some that will steal missions. So you can flat out take a mission away from someone. So if someone took this from me, I would lose 11 points and they would gain 11 points. And all of a sudden there's a 22 point swing. Now that sounds huge. It sounds gigantic, but we'll talk a little bit about it in our final thoughts. It doesn't mean that you're completely screwed and out of the game. In fact, it means you now have a chance to screw with your opponents. Now, Aside from drawing cards on your turn, you also have the option of playing an agent from your hand. If this agent was in my hand, you'll notice that there uh, is a black box with an agent symbol on it on each of the cards. When you play the card towards a mission, you get the top part. When you play it as your action for your turn from your hand, you get the bottom part. And this one says, view all mission cards held by another player. So I could choose to play that see the mission cards my opponent has face down in front of them and start to determine what's out here, what they're going to go after, and what I want to get rid of or what I want to draw and almost hate draft to get away from them. Now there's a lot of interesting things and mechanics that are going to happen in this game because there's a lot of different cards that will interact back and forth with each of the players. Now in addition, once you complete your missions, you have to discard down the 10 cards. So there's a lot of hand management that happens throughout the game. There is also a common discard pile. So there's going to be cards that will force you to discard cards. There's going to be times when you have more than 10 cards and you have to discard down to 10 cards. So as this happens, there's going to be cards from all the different decks intermingled into a common discard pile. As you can imagine, there's also cards that will let you get things out of that discard pile. In addition, Aside from drawing your two cards or playing an agent, you do have the option of taking one of five special actions. You can collect any one card from the discard pile. You can collect any two cards from the discard pile. You can collect any one card from any one city deck, meaning you can just search through the deck and find any one card. You can collect any one card from the mission deck, meaning again, you can search through it and find whatever card you want, or you can force any other player to discard any one card of their choice from a completed mission, which means of course they will lose those points. Now, those sound really powerful, and you may ask yourself, well, if I had the option to go collect one card from the discard pile, and I have the option to go, go collect two cards from the discard pile, why wouldn't I do the one that gets me two cards? Well, here's why. Every action that's a special action is going to cost you points. And as you'll see here, collecting one card from the discard pile will cost you to spend five points from your hand. Collecting two will cost you seven. Collecting one card from any one deck will cost you five. Collecting one card from the mission deck will cost you seven. And forcing a player to discard a card will also cost you five. So what does that mean, cost me five and cost me seven? Well, what it means is you have to look at the cards in your hand and use that amount of points from the cards that are available to you. 
So if I wanted to get any one card out of the discard pile, I could discard these two cards from my hand, which are a value of five, to go get that one red card that maybe I need to complete a mission and get rid of my orange and yellow. Those special actions seem expensive at first, but the speed of the game and all of the different things happening make a well-timed special action very, very critical to changing the tide of the game. Those are your three options during your turn. Draw two cards, two face down, two face up, or one face down and one face up from any deck or any face up of the cards. You could play an agent, or you could perform a special action. Then once you've taken one of those actions, you can then complete missions, you gain points, and the interrupts are the only things outside of those rules. The interrupts are very special cards that have that exclamation point on it, like the snitch that we showed you at the very beginning. Exclamation points can be played at any time on anyone's turn. And yes, there is a lot of actions that are gonna mess with a lot of things in the game. There's going to be things that will force you to discard spy gear, that will force you to take agents from another player's hand, that will force you to take things from other people's completed missions, or even more fun, there's beneficial things that will help you add to your missions. So there's things that will say to add a piece of intelligence or to add a spy gear to another mission. The challenge with that is while you want to do that to rack up your own points and keep increasing your total, that's going to make that mission a target for other spies to either deal with and mess with or possibly steal from you altogether. So that's Ace of Spies. One thing I failed to mention in the gameplay overview, there is another action you can take on your turn. You have the option of drawing three cards from the mission deck and choosing one or more to keep. Similar to Ticket to Ride, whenever you take three cards from the mission deck, you must keep at least one. And of course, at the end of the game, complete, incompleted missions are going to count against you. So choose wisely when accepting new missions. Ace of Spies is a highly interactive game. I will tell you straight from the start, if you do not like games where the goal is to purposefully mess with other players, this game is not for you. This is a game that you need to go in with a lighthearted feel because you're going to screw your neighbor. It's essentially, I want that point, I want that mission, I'm going to backstab you, I'm going to dirty handed just take that mission away from you. There's so much interaction. It, it really is a tense game. And as small as it is, and as light as it is, it is actually very strategic. There are a lot of times where, especially with the interrupt cards and all the different actions that can happen, you have to time what it is you're going to do and when you're going to do it. You really do get the feeling that you are a spy trying to subterfuge and go through this cities of cloak and dagger and get these missions completed. And while we talked about the gameplay, there's a lot of times where you may have a 20, 25, 30 point swing because of stealing you know, a 10, a 15 point mission from somebody. Now while that is, seems huge, it's not unsurmountable. In fact, the game we just played last night, I was beating my opponent by 45 points and I got crushed at the end. All of a sudden my opponent throws down two missions that they were able to complete in a row and stole one of my missions and boom, it was just off to the races. It is a lot of fun. As you can tell from just my voice and my passion, this game really pulls you in and makes you want to just get into it more. But that said again, if you don't like games where you're messing with other people and maybe you end up in a position where one guy just does nothing but messes with other people, this is not your kind of game and you probably won't like it. So let's start with the components. So the box is very similar to Gene Grafter. If you saw our review, it's the same size as that. It has that same silky feel, and it will, with the components in there, the top will come off very quickly and very easily. Now, it's actually kind of nice, and I didn't think about this until I was in discussion with one of the Albino Dragon guys, is that because these boxes are so small, they're really easy to just throw a rubber band around, put them in your bag, and take them off to a game night. So that's actually really cool. It's all cards. 
and the one board. The cards are really good quality, just like the Gene Grafter cards. They've chosen a supplier that does a really good job. The cards are also very colorful. There are three different artists that work on this. Shane Tyree, of course, the person that did the Gene Grafter art and the art for the Cthulhu and the bicycle cards is part of this. And it's a very unique style. It does give you that cloak and dagger feel. I really liked the agents. The way that they had the agents have the like black and white charcoal kind of look to the colors or to the drawings and not have any colors in there. These were really cool. And we found that the agents were a really, really big part of the game. But more on that in a second. The board itself, very well done. It's stiff and it's sealed all the way around. So very similar to the boards that you got with Gene Grafter. There's no seams and the, the stickers and stuff are not going to be coming off. So they've done a really good job with that. The tokens and the meeples are, well, quite frankly, tokens and meeples. They're pretty straightforward. So component-wise, really, really good job. The box does have a well inside of it that you can keep everything in, and it has two sides for both your decks, and then a side in the, or a little middle section for your tokens and your meeples. There's also reference cards that have the turn actions, and then your special actions on the front and the back, so you can keep track of the beginning. But as I said, at first, while the game may sound complex, a couple of times through, and you start to pick up on it. Now, in terms of gameplay, it's very interesting. Like I said, the agents are really powerful. Using their abilities when you complete a mission or playing them from your hand as one of your actions for your turn and using their spy tactic, they're very impactful and they can change the game quite a bit. And it really does come down to playing them at the right time to really make the best impact in the game. Now, the other thing that was interesting is that the intelligence cards seem to be the most important because the intelligence cards will range from one, two, and three points listed on their card. Now, the intelligence, the locations, and the spy gear don't do anything other than add points to your missions and represent different colors from the sets that you have to collect. That was a little bit of a disappointment, although with as much activity that happens from the agents, I think they did that to focus the game around the theme of being an agent. You can think about it, if you go to a location, while it may be neat to have that location do something, it doesn't necessarily have to if you have all of these agents doing all the different things throughout the game. But the spy gear is all worth one point, and the locations are all worth one point as well. So while there are different locations and different spy gear, and the pictures look good, the names are really cool, and the flavor text is really good, there's not much of a difference to them other than making sure you have the right color from the right city to complete your mission. So the intelligence was the second most important card we found in terms of trying to get the highest uh, value intelligence to add to your missions. The danger in all that, of course, comes down to the fun of the gameplay is that you could go and use one of your special actions to search through the uh, orange deck in Paris and get your highest value cost intelligence, add it to your mission, and the minute you're done playing that mission, your opponent goes, oh, how many points was that? Oh, that was 16? Congratulations, I'm going to steal it. And they take it away from you. And it happens that quickly, which to me, makes it very fun because it's a very engaging environment. There's a lot of interaction among players and there's no downtime. When it's not your turn, in fact, in some cases, depending on the strategy you use when it's not your turn, you're highly interested in what the other players are playing because you're going to have interrupt cards that can impact them as they complete missions or as they play agents. But there are some strategies you can deploy where you're going to go in and say, you know what, I'm not going to try and complete anything. I'm just going to go after all the interrupt cards and try to capture them to stop my opponents and steal their stuff. It's a fun strategy to use. It won't make you the most popular person at the table. I can speak from experience, but it is a very interesting tactic to use. The other thing that we noticed that was very interesting is that in a two-player game versus a five-player game, it is very different. In a two-player game, there's not as much to remember about what people are taking and what you think they're trying to collect. There is also a lot of very direct interaction with the interrupts because you're going to play them against each other and pretty much that's it. So a two-player game felt much more tactical. A four- and five-player game, much more strategic. As usual with games like this, the more the merrier. 
There's a lot of laughter, a lot of, oh, I can't believe he just did that, or, oh, my Lord, he just took that from me. There's a lot of activity happening between the players. But because of the larger amount of players, there's going to be different people that you're going to play your interrupts on, and you're going to have to work with what they have out, what you have in your hand, and be able to strategize when the best time is to play an agent, when the best time is to play an interrupt, and just plot out your strategy to be as dirty and nasty as you can be. Overall, this game is a lot of fun. It is a crit of a game. I have yet to introduce it to somebody over the last two weeks or week and a half of playing it that looked at it and said, meh. Everybody was intrigued. Everyone likes spies for some reason. They like the idea of jabbing it to their opponents. Now, we've had some games where somebody was a little too dirty and a little too underhanded and people got a little frustrated at that. But it was still a fun experience, and it was a good time when you sit down either against one opponent or against multiple opponents and start trying to collect these sets and start doing dirty tricks to each other and just having a lot of interactive, engaging fun. It is a beautiful looking game. The artwork is very fun and engaging, and it makes you feel very much like you're in a world of espionage. The names are very cool. Some of them are tongue-in-cheek. Some of them are very familiar. And the just different interactions make it a great experience when you sit down and play a two-player or play a five-player game. If I had kickstarted this, I'd be very happy when this showed up at my doorstep. If I hadn't, I'd definitely check out the options available in the White Rabbit Kickstarter right now to see if it's something that I want to get as well through that pledge level. But that is Ace of Spies. It's dirty, it's nasty, it's underhanded, and it's a lot of fun. It gets a crit from critshappen.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Did you kickstart this and it makes you excited to see it? Have you never seen it before and you're interested in learning more about it? Let us know what you think. Leave your comments here on the YouTube channel. You can, of course, find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Google Plus by searching Crits Happen and at our homepage at critshappen.com. Additionally, don't forget, if you go to critshappen.com and find the written review for Ace of Spies, which there'll be a link for at the bottom of this video, you can go there and cast your vote on if this is a crit, a hit, or a miss. But until we see you next time, we hope you enjoy your world in the dirty, underhanded espionage tactics of Ace of Spies. Thanks so much for watching. Keep rolling those dice, and we hope they're all crits.